This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 12th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, we only covered the first two of our three issues. First, as the drumbeat starts for increasing the base student allocation, the BSA, We discuss why we need to be talking about who pays for any increase at the same time as we discuss whether and how much any increase should be. And second, Michael and I debate whether the governor should have vetoed the tax on e-cigarettes that overwhelmingly passed both bodies of the legislature this past session. We take so long on that issue, we have rolled the third, our reaction to the appointment of Devin Mitchell as the interim commissioner of revenue to next week. And now let's join Michael. So let's get into it, Brad, the weekly top three. Number one, you've already heard it, the weeping, the wailing, the gnashing of teeth, the rending of clothing. It's for the children. We have a $68 million deficit. We've got a $550 million budget for less than over 100,000 kids. And we just don't know what to do because we don't have enough money The Anchorage School District is out there on a plea campaign to try and get somebody to give them some more money. And uh, you're saying that any increase to the base student allocation, which is what they're talking about, is going to cost and who's going to pay? Yeah, exactly right, Michael. And and I think the Anchorage School District announcement that they're facing a $60 million uh, revenue shortfall budget deficit uh, next year is going to add fuel to the fire. We've already seen... Uh, some op-eds showing up. We've already seen candidates talking about it. I think this is going to be, frankly, one big difference uh, uh, that that whether you elect a coalition or not is going to make. If you elect a coalition in the House and in the Senate, I think you're going to see a big push for BSA increases. You may even see it uh, if the Republicans win, because it's going to be a it's going to be a for the children type campaign. We've seen uh, even Republicans be re. Uh, uh, respond to that uh, in in past periods. Um, so I think I think the BSA is going to be high on the agenda. BSA increase, uh, base student allocation increase, is going to be high on the agenda coming in uh, to uh, to the next legislature. the The issue that I hope we focus on uh, as that as that hits is not only do we need the increase, but if we're going to have an increase, who pays? Uh, the way we have set up government now, it's going to be middle and lower income Alaska families. If we continue to do what we've done in the past, it's going to be middle and lower income Alaska families uh, through additional uh, PFD cuts. Uh, To me, this is a clear example of why we need to focus on the who pays issue, because that's, that's unfair. That's, that is, that is horribly regressive and horribly misplaced and horribly misallocated to push the costs of any BSA increase on to middle and lower income, only on the middle and lower income Alaska families. I think the I think the who pays issue. If you fo- if if we focus on the who pays issue and and say, look, if the BSA if the BSA has increased, all Alaska families have to contribute to it uh, in some sort of proportional manner. If the BSA, it, I, I think that is important to push that issue because that sh- that could engage the top twenty percent finally in pushing back. On, on increased spending. If they think, if the top 20% who's been apathetic about spending issues, they'll give lip service to the need to cut spending, but they won't give the votes and they won't give the, the lobbyists uh, uh, the effort to, to try to cut spending. 
if uh, if they think they're going to face part of this increase, if they think they're that we're going to spread the costs equitably across all Alaska families and engage the top 20 percent, I, th- I think we're going to see we, we are more likely to see the top 20 percent pushing back on spending. And I think that would make a difference uh, in the legislature. So uh, big I, issue coming, big, big issue coming up. I think the issue is the real issue behind it's going to be who pays. For I mean, I, I agree with that, but I think you've hit the nail on the head really of the fundamental issue is that if we should increase the BSA, I mean, the BSA, a lot of that money is being sucked up by administrative and overhead and everything else. We talked yesterday, um, yesterday or day before, you know, what do we get? Like 40% of every dollar ends up in the classroom for the university at 17 cents on every dollar. I mean, we're looking at the, you know, the consumption of all this funding is actually being picked up and, 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 and sucked up by the overhead, which to me would mean that the administrations are the ones that need to look in their inside their own houses, not in the classroom, but inside their own houses to do it. I mean, I understand what you're saying is that that's the argument that we need to make when it actually hits the floor. But the bigger question, I think, is should we be increasing the BSA of five hundred and fifty dollars for, you know, whatever it is, one hundred thousand students? That's I mean, I don't think even think it's that high, but it's that's a lot. Michael, I think I think the I think they go hand in hand, and the reason is. You and I can talk about, you know, the, the things that we can do to, to, to avoid a BS increase, BSA increase. Charlie Pierce wrote a good op-ed a few uh, weeks ago uh, on, on the overhead issue and on the administration issue, that how much is spent on administration. And I think that's a good issue to push. But you and me, middle and lower income Alaska families, have not been able to push back on spending and, and reduce spending by a material amount. We saw that in 2019. We saw it in 2020. We've seen it in every legislative session uh, 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 since uh, Dunleavy's been governor. We can talk about it a lot. We can push back on it. But without the top 20 percent engaged on these issues, we're not making progress in, in pushing back on spending. I think if we talk about both the whether we need an increase and if we're going to have an increase, who pays for that increase at the same time and push hard, that if there is an increase, it's got to be the costs have got to be spread equitably. I think there's a chance we engage the top 20 percent and in, in, in pushing back on the spending. If we if we wait until the BSA increase is already done, then start talking about about who pays. I think it's I think it's too late. I think the top 20 percent will say, ah, let's just keep going down the road. Uh, we've been going down. So it's to me, it's it's important to talk about these two issues directly uh, at the same time to get the top 20% engaged in uh, in pushing back on spending. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets is our guest. So how do we frame it, Brad, in your mind? I mean, what is the, you know, what is the best way to frame this argument if we have to, I mean, basically, essentially, we're fighting two battles, the if we should increase it, and then the who pays if we should increase it. So how should we be framing this if we're talking to our elected representatives in your mind? In, in in that way, Michael, as 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 two issues, should we increase it? The answer is no. But if we do increase it, and and you know we need to face the fact that we may have coalitions in both the House and the Senate, which would virtually ensure that there will be an increase. If we increase it, uh, then it, the cost of that increase, uh, the cost of education generally, but the cost of that increase certainly need to be spread equitably. We we need to stop this. This, this trend of just pushing the costs off on middle and lower income Alaska families. They need to be spread equitably across all Alaska families through some sort of tax. So it's, I, I, think, I think you just say, I just, you frame the issue as two issues at once. Uh, do we need it? No. But if we have it, uh, then the costs need to be spread equitably. And I think that second issue triggers the top 20, 20% to start pushing back on the costs. I mean, we've, We've seen we've seen Natasha, we've seen Stevens, we've seen all of the all of the you know top twenty percent Republicans, uh, Thompson in the House, Lebon in the House. We've seen them be very apathetic about spending. I mean, they they they've bent over backwards. Oh, it's for the children, so we need to do that. I think we're going to continue to see them be that way until they and their constituents have to face the music with respect to the cost as well. Uh, one of the arguments that I've seen in the past, and Charlie makes in the chat room right now, is. How about linking uh, linking spending to performance? 
Uh, that's something that we've been calling for for a long time. I mean, we continue to spend ever increasing amounts of money, and yet we're still in the bottom 48th, 49th, 50th, you know, of 50 states. I mean, it, is there any chance of that in your mind? Oh, great argument. Uh, push the argument. But once again, you and me and, and, and the remainder of middle and lower income Alaska families making the argument haven't been enough to push back on uh, to push back on spending in the past. We need to engage the top 20 percent um, in that argument as well. We need to make them part of the issue. They need to feel part of the exposure, part of the risk of having to pay for this uh, if uh, if the if the legislature approves it. And then we need them to start talking about things like administrative overhead. We need them to talk about um, uh, things like uh, uh, linking it to, to spending or linking it to, to lower 48 uh, uh, standards. We can talk about that all day long. You and I have long since figured out how we can cut government spending down to, uh, down to traditional revenue levels, but we right. haven't achieved it because it's just been you, me, and, and middle and lower income Alaska families talking about it. We need to engage the top 20% in, in this conversation as well. We need their resources, their connections with legislators that they've that they've derived through donations and contributions and other things. They're lobbyists to be concerned about it and to push back on, on it also. Uh, we've seen a lot, we've seen a lot of reasoning behind this, uh, you know, for the children, et cetera, et cetera. But really what it seems to be for is for the teacher unions, in fact, um, and for the bureaucracies. Uh, because we see things like this comment in the ADN article from Corey Aist, who's the president of the AEA, the Anchorage uh, Education Association. He says, these issues create unnecessary stress. Uh, he says, this story, isn't, this story isn't really necessary. What is a district going to cut and how are they going to cut that? The question is, why are they being forced to go through that process? Basically, they should have unlimited funds. There shouldn't be unnecessary stress. I mean, like, the rest of the world and businesses and people have to deal with every day that stress of having to live within their means. Yep. And guess what? And guess what? Zach Fields and other Democrats say, yeah, we, we need to do that. And we need to take it out of PFD cuts be, or we need to take it through PFD cuts because, you know, the PFD is free money and it really, you know, it really belongs to all Alaskans and we ought to be spending it for things we need it for, including, including for the children. They know, they know, the Democrats know that if the top 20% are engaged, they're going to be in trouble in, in being able to push these spending increases. They know if the top 20% have to pay for part of spending, that, that, that's, that there's going to be a significant amount of pushback on that spending. So you're yeah. not only going to see, you're not only going to see Democrats and the, and the unions, and Zach Fields is the poster child for this. You're not only going to see Democrats and the unions say, we need to do it for the children. We just need to do it out of permanent fund earnings, which is sort of the euphemism for PFD cuts. We need to do it out of permanent fund earnings because after all, it's free money and, it's, and, you know, right, and, we, right. and, we, and we get to decide where it goes. So again, I mean, they're also signaling that they're concerned about the top 20% being engaged. They're, they know that if the top 20% is engaged, that their spending patterns are going to be in trouble. I mean, I think Charlie's comment, which I, I keep wanting to come back to, how about linking spending to performance? I mean, as ideal as that would be, that's never going to happen because they don't want to have their monies tied to performance because then they would have to perform. They'd have to actually have an outcome that was viable. They would have to actually compete in the marketplace of ideas. And that's not something that they're down with, Brad. No, I, they don't want to do that. And they, and they don't want to take any actions. I mean, it's not just that. They don't want to take any actions that result in constraining spending. I mean, they're not only going to push for an increase in the BSA, they're going to push for a defined benefit uh, plan for teachers because, you know, we got a shortage of teachers up here. And God, you know, by the end of it, we may be pushing pushing for a defined benefit plan for bus drivers because we got a bus driver shortage. We, we're going we're gonna to face a, a tremendous amount of pressure for, for the children. Um, and, and, you know, we're in you and I and, and listeners in the chat room are going to be able to come up with all sorts of reasons and all sorts of, 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 of approaches for how to, how to reduce spending or how to, how to limit spending. But let, but let me say this again, you and I and other middle and lower income Alaska families have not been able to push back on spending, uh, since, since 2019, since when, when this governor got installed and tried to 
tried to uh, cut spending back to traditional levels. All the ideas we come up with, all of the all of the rationalizations for keeping spending down, they're all great. They all work. They all would work. But there's not the political will to do it. And why is there not the political will? Because the top 20% aren't engaged in the effort. They will give it lip service. They'll say, yeah, 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 we need to cut spending a little bit here and there. But ultimately, when it comes to for the children, that they, they'll they be votes. I mean, Steve Thompson, Bart LeBon, Natasha Von Imhoff, Gary Stevens, you can just go down the list. They'll be votes for, you know, for the, for the children, for increasing spending, for pushing back on spending cuts. So we have to get all Alaska families, particularly the top 20%, particularly the donor class, engaged in the effort. If we don't, it's just going to, we're going to come up with a bunch of ideas. We're going to run ourselves ragged talking about them, uh, but we're not going to achieve political success. And uh, I mean, you and I agree on that. I mean, that's been uh, that's been part of our reasoning for this whole time is that, uh, you know, until they get engaged, until they start to feel it in the pocketbook as everybody else uh, does, there's never going to be any appetite, and especially since many of them are connected in some way, shape or form to the crony class which is the crony capitalist class of businesses that are basically built their entire business model on government contracts and living on government funds. And that's part of that's part of our problem right now. I mean, the Democrats have figured out that they can increase spending as long as they push it to middle and lower income Alaska families. They don't care. They don't care about the economic impact on lower and middle income Alaska families. They, they, they figured out they can increase spending as long as they push it down there, as long as they keep the top 20 percent apathetic. And as long as we keep going down that road, you and I are going to talk ourselves blue in the face about about the various ways in which we can cut spending and keep it down. But we're not going to be successful because the Democrats and and, and the moderate Republicans are going to keep end running it by just taking money out of the continuing to take money out of the PFD. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're coming up on the break. Brad, you say up next, the governor has vetoed a bill that would help the PFD them's fighting words in my mind. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about that. Give me a quick tease here. Well, the governor vetoed a bill that would have established a tax uh, on e-cigarettes. And I and I know I'm leading with my chin when I start talking about a tax on vaping products uh, uh, with you. But uh, the governor, the, the legislature passed by broad majorities. And we're going to talk about those majorities. By mo- broad majorities, <laughs> cute, very cute. By broad majorities, uh, in both the House and the Senate, in fact, the Senate twice passed by broad majorities, uh, a, a relatively small tax that would have increased revenues, would have reduced the dependence on the PFD for, for paying for government. Um, and, uh, and, and the governor vetoed it because he said he's just not going to agree to any tax. So I think that's a mistake. I think it results in additional pressure on the PFD, additional pressure on PFD cuts. And I'll, and I'll explain why after the break. Continuing now. Uh, Brad Keithley, our guest, uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. Uh, Brad, uh, your next uh, discussion and talking point was about a bill that the governor vetoes. The Alaska Beacon has the article, Alaska governor vetoes bill to tax e-cigarettes and raise minimum age of tobacco. Um, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll have your take on this first before I, uh, before I lose my mind. <laughs> Well, here's the deal, Michael. We're in an era of a leftover PFD. The, the, the legislature, Von Imhoff, has been clear about it. Others less so. But, but it's clear we're in the age of a, of a leftover PS, PFD. And what's the leftover PFD? The PFD, the, the PFD cut uh, or the level of the PFD cut is what's necessary to balance the budget after spending uh, reduced by other revenues. That's what the PFD is. It's the leftover PFD. Here we had a bill. Um, it's not the world's biggest bill. It's about a million two hundred thousand dollars. So it's not gonna it's not gonna really do a lot to anything in terms of money. But here we had a bill that the legislature finally passed that would have increased revenues. And by increasing revenues, it would have increased the amount of the of the leftover PFD. It passed. This is a tax bill. You know, everybody says we can't pass tax bills. It's a bill that passed the Senate the first time, fifteen to four. It's a bill that passed the House after being amended to reduce the tax. It's a bill that passed the House 31 to 9. Kevin McCabe, for example, voted for it uh, in the House. Uh, Mike Cronk voted for it in the House. Sarah Vance voted for it in the House. 
It passes the House 31 to 9. It has to, because it got amended in the House, it has to go back to the Senate. It passes the Senate the second time, 18 to 2. Rob Myers votes for it uh, uh, in the Senate the second time. So you have a you have a tax bill finally. I mean, we, we can't, people say we can't pass any tax bills. We have a tax bill finally that passes the legislature by huge numbers, comes up to the governor. What does the governor do? He vetoes it because it contains a tax, a million two hundred thousand dollar tax. Talk about talk about sending a message that this governor's not open to doing things that will improve the PFD. That was exactly it. Massive pass and massive numbers in the Senate, the House and the Senate again, and the governor vetoes it. So I just, you know, I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated by this governor who talks about we've got to increase the, the PFD. We've got a bill that would help do that by by in, by reducing the, the leftover amount that needs to be taken out of the PFD. And yet the governor vetoes it. All right. You ready? Um, here's the problem. Okay, yeah, so we're going to put up your Dukes. Here we go. This is the put up your Duke segment. Um, so here's the problem. The portion of the bill that the governor had issue with was the tax on electronic uh, smoking products, e-cigarettes, vapes, whatever you want to call it. Um, here is the problem. Vaping is used as a cessation tool for many people who smoke. Now, I've never really smoked, so I'm kind of an outlier on this deal. But many people, and I, I have many friends who have used vaping as a way to get away from tobacco product, burning tobacco products like cigarettes, et cetera. Um, and in other countries, they have used this successfully as a cessation tool to help people stop smoking and to get healthier. Uh, this bill would have increased uh, a significant component of, of uh, you know, on vaping products. Um, but the biggest part to me was this. This is the comment from Gary Stevens. The tax portion of the bill was aimed at discouraging people from getting addicted. One of the things we've seen in tobacco taxation is that every time taxes are increased on tobacco, and they're including vaping products in that because there's nicotine, although nicotine is not tobacco, they're calling it tobacco. And they have been increased several times in Alaska, so people stop using it. Anytime we see a government trying to have behavior modification through taxation on people, that is an inappropriate use of power, first and foremost. Secondly, the bill, they're talking about putting a 45% wholesale tax on products, meaning they're going to tax, if it costs, if it costs a, a 10 bucks, it's going to be $14.50 by the time you're done. That's just for the cost to the supplier, and then your costs are going to go up. Not to mention the fact that, for example, the city of Anchorage has over a 50% tax on vaping products, and the, the Matsu Borough or Wasilla has another 40% on top of that. And the thing is, are we trying to make people healthy, or are we trying to drive people back to cigarettes, which have the lowest tax at $2 a pack when it's all said and done? And is this really about behavior modification, or is this just about people who are offended about people trying to make their lives better? And like you said, it's a million bucks out of a six plus billion dollar budget. I'm not saying that we shouldn't find cuts and things, but taxing people and trying to modify their behavior through taxation is, in my opinion, immoral. It's none of your damn business what people do. Now, again, especially when you're talking about a 45% or a 25% or a, the final bill was 35% wholesale price on, on, uh, on vaping products. That makes no sense whatsoever. Why are we trying to hurt people who are trying to get to a healthier lifestyle? That's my question. Well, we're always going to, every tax is going to have some downside. Every tax is going to have some pushback. And, and I don't disagree that, that this may have uh, uh, some, some impacts. But look, the Matt Sue has a tax on, on this. As you just pointed out, Anchorage has a tax on this. And, and it's, not like, it's not like this state in, its, in, 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 in at least some of the localities haven't faced that issue and decided to go, go ahead uh, with the tax in any event. The tax here would have would have equalized the tax on e-cigarettes, vaping products uh, versus tobacco. They weren't penalizing e-cigarettes. They were just equalizing it uh, to uh, uh, to cigarettes. I, you know, I, I, you know, vaping a heck of a lot better than I do. 
So I'm not going to I'm not going to get into a vaping argument with you. But this was this was an opportunity again that passed the Senate the first time 15 4 passed the House 31 9 and passed the Senate again the second time 18 2. This was an opportunity finally to have some alternative revenues that would help reduce the reduce the dependency, reduce the the impact on PFDs. And the governor, the governor vetoes it. The governor didn't veto it because he thought it was, you know, somehow an infringement on rights. What he said was there were many conversations about what an appropriate level of tax would be, but ultimately a tax increase on the people of Alaska is not something I can support. That's not an argument about vaping. That's not saying it's an infringement on 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 vapors' rights uh, to have uh, to have this tax. It's just saying I can't agree to any tax, and and that is that is that's going to be the death of the PFD if we can't have alternative. If this governor is saying we can't have alternative revenues that help reduce the dependence that our state government has come uh, has come to have on PFD cuts, if we can't have alternative revenues, if that's what this governor is saying, then we're in a world of hurt. Uh, we we may we might as well just stop talking about the PFD because it's just going to keep being the revenue source that that people go to. So I I, I, I we we can't have a boxing match on the on the uh, on on the vaping issue because you'll just knock me out every time. Well, but, and we, I, but, I don't but we can't but, but but we can have a disagreement on whether or not the state needs alternative revenues and whether this was a because of the massive votes behind it whether this was a good opportunity to have alternative revenues. Uh, and, and I think your, your justification will look, the Matsu has a tax and the Anchorage has a tax, so it must be okay. And the majority of the legislature agreed, so it must be okay. The, leg- the majority of the legislatures agreed to spend $16 billion over the last six years out of our savings. That doesn't make it okay. That's not a valid justification for a tax on people. Again, I would say probably arguably that the people who are smoking and who will go back to smoking are probably in the lower to median incomes as well. So they again will be disproportionately affected. So this is a doubling down on like the PFD taxation as well. And raising the smoking age from 18 to 21, we could still draft them. We could still send them in the military. They can still be tried as adults, but they can't choose for the, they can't choose their own, uh, you know, choose their own poison at the end of the day. It, it, the whole thing to me, was somebody's pet project. This was Peter Machicki's pet project and Gary Stevens's pet project to begin with. And I think that overall it's wrong because they may not agree with something. They're going to go ahead and utilize it. You know, it's a sin tax. If you don't like it, I think it's a sin. It's a sin tax. You're going to pay. And again, look at what the National Health Service in England did over there. They made it available as a cessation tool all over the place. Again, you don't want to argue on that. But the bottom line is, it, it to me, it makes no sense in the long run when you've already got taxes on taxes on taxes. When you're talking about the things will be there'll be a hundred percent tax almost at the wholesale level on a single product. Name me another single product that's got nearly a hundred percent wholesale tax on it. You got a minute here to finish up. Oh, almost the PF uh, the PFD. It's not a hundred percent yet, but but we're headed toward it. I mean, we we are what we're doing in this state is we're targeting taxes. We're singling out certain sorts of sources of revenue like the PFD, and we're singling out certain products like vaping to, 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 to tax, to, to, to raise revenues. We're not broadly spreading the tax. And what does a broad tax do? It increases the denominator and lowers the take from, from everybody that, that you have to, that, that you take from them. I mean, what the problem with the PFD is you ha- you're having to take a billion dollars targeted against the PFD. Again, I just see this as a doubling down on taxation of people who are already being kicked as far no, as this no, goes. But no, no, being- I, no, I disagree with that. This is not a doubling down. This is an alternative source. It's regressive. I don't, I don't disagree with that. But it's not as regressive as PFD cuts. And these things you have to look at relatively. Is it, is it better than 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 the regressivity you get out of PFD cuts and and yes it is it, it's regressive, but it's but it's less regressive uh, than PFD cuts. So I I don't view it as doubling down. I view it as as yes targeting a a, a given segment of of the population. But so do PFD cuts. They target middle and lower income Alaska families. And the question is which targeting is worse in terms of of regressivity.
Um, I'm, I don't even know where to go at this point. I'm just, I, I'm so irritated by this whole thing uh, because I've been looking to see what it's doing to businesses and everything else um, and to the local folks and, and my friends who, you know, one friend who smoked a pack a day and who's like, well, if this little bottle of juice that used to be $12 now costs $30, which is what's happening, then I guess I'll just go back to smoking cigarettes because that makes more sense and the tax is cheaper. Um, I mean, it just, you know, it makes no sense. This behavior modification uh, through taxation is, again, I'll say it, it's immoral. I mean, to, to say, so, you know, to try and control somebody through the taxation is an immoral thing. But, you know, I, I, I want you to get on to number three, Brad, because you, know, <laughs> not gonna, you and I are not going to agree on this because, again, I mean, I, and I, look, I'm, oh, we're, we're, we're going to have this debate every time about every tax. Somebody's going to come on and say, oh, you can't tax that because it does X. Well, the problem is the alternative is just continuing to take PFD cuts. And PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and the largest adverse impact on the overall economy of any of the alternatives. I guess I this is the question. Does the government really have a business? Does, is it really their business to try and decide to tax me and change my behavior? Is that their business? Keep in mind, Michael, Dunleavy didn't veto this because of behavior modification. Oh, I'm talking about the sponsors of the bill said they, they were doing it for behavior modification. They wanted people to be healthier and they want them to not be addicted. And so they're going to tax them. Is that the government's business? I, you know, you're going to you're going to you're going to level me every time oh, on that just, particular issue. It's a taxation issue. Is it? I mean, again, I don't and, and I'm not trying to beat you up, Brad. I'm just trying to say and I agree with you that we have to find a way to try and fund outside of the PFD. What we should be doing is pushing back on all the spending to get down beyond the PFD and that they shouldn't be taking it. But I mean, a. a this whole this whole thing right here, to me, it just it disproportionately affects people who are trying to get better, who are trying you to and get better. I, you own. and I have talked have talked ourselves until we're blue in the face about the need to cut spending. I agree with you. We don't disagree. We don't disagree on that. But we've not succeeded. And why have we not succeeded? Because we're not we're not engaging the top 20 percent. Yeah, maybe this tax doesn't engage the top 20 percent either, but it's some revenue. It's some step that the legislature by overwhelming votes approved. So I, I, you know, yes, this, this, this particular tax has problems. Every tax is going to have problems. If not you, I'm going to be debating with somebody else over, over some, over other taxes. The problem is if we don't do something of that nature and we finally got this one through the legislature, if we don't do something of that nature, we're just going to continue down the road of PFD cuts. Uh, the, uh, I'm just, I'm just looking at the chat, at the chat room here. Uh, funny how Michael doesn't like a tax. He opposes it, but let's do an income tax. I mean, look, I'm not in favor of an income tax. I said, if we have to have it, it's probably the best one, the flat tax, but I'm not in favor of an income tax. I'm in favor of cutting the budget. That's what I've been talking about for years. Brad and I have both talked about that for years, but if we have to have one, should it be a flat tax? That's the question. Um, and I think what really irks me about this whole thing more than anything else is the blatant in your face parochialism and uh, you poor, poor, pitiful children. We have got to decide for you that you need to be healthier. And so we're going to tax you into uh, into behaving properly. And that really is one of the things that irritates me. And again, the many people that I know that will be affected by this and could shorten their lives because of it. It, you know, it, it just irritates me. That's I guess that's the big thing. Let me try it this way. I would have preferred another tax. I would have preferred a, a, a non-targeted. I would have preferred a broad-based tax. Even if it only raises a, bi a million two, I would have preferred a broad-based tax uh, to try to do that. But this is, this is one that finally got through the legislature. And it got through the legislature by overwhelming numbers. And it just sort of, for the governor to just sort of spit back in their face, not on the vaping issue, not on the behavior modification issue, but because, quote, ultimately a tax increase on the people of, of Alaska is not something I can support. For the governor to spit back in their face on that, I think is just, I, I, don't, I don't understand how we're supposed to solve this problem if we can't engage the top 20%, if we can't make everybody responsible, uh, a broader base of people responsible for paying for government. 
And I'm referring back to the article that you sent me. The bill also included a tax on electronic smoking products that contain nicotine, which is what Dunleavy took issue with. It's not in his quote, but apparently in his whole comment, he said that was the part that he had heartburn with. So he didn't have a comment other than other than this letter. I mean, he doesn't comment on anything. That's Dunleavy. Well, that's true, too. I mean, that's true. Too. All right. Well, um, we don't have time now to get to number three because... Put up your dukes, man. Um, all right. So we're gonna uh we're gonna we're gonna leave it there. I guess maybe we'll pick up the number three next week and have it as number two or number one or something. And uh, we'll continue. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board and sharing with us. I appreciate it. Michael, uh, this is this is great radio. And and thank you for not blowing smoke in my face a second time. I just thought that was funny. I just thought that would be easy. And it wasn't literally in his face, folks. It was at the camera. Man, people are so <laughs> sensitive these days. All right, Brad. Well, thank you so much for coming on board and joining us. We appreciate you being a part of it today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.